up ladies and gentlemen i'm your host truth seeker this is the truth seeker podcast excited delighted to be with you guys again got an awesome guest lined up for you guys today a good friend of mine actually so those are some fun ones we can uh you know people i hang out with and people that you may not know so i want to introduce you to my good friend uh we're going to hear some of his stories uh he's a musician an artist uh man plays the piano does so much stuff shares his testimony and things and we're going to get into that uh but first i want to say a huge thank you to everybody who's uh, supporting my work via patreon uh thank you guys from the bottom of my heart this show would not be possible without your help so again thank you guys for everything that you do um if you'd like to support head on over to patreon.com backslash true seeker there you get access to my entire discography of music it's 200 plus songs. You get access to our Thursday night school of the mystics. This is our community aspect to what we build here. Hang out, conversations, uh, get into courses and, and discussion together, all that cool stuff. So uh, our discord, if you're looking for community, make sure you get plugged in with what we're bringing to the table, man. There's a bunch of like minded people out there who believe in very similar things like you do. And just trust me, you're not alone. So uh, school of the mystics, the uh, the discography, all of that you get access to. Uh, Sunday morning seer class, uh, we have options available for that as well. Patreon.com backslash True Seeker. Um, I got an event I want to talk about. We'll go into a little bit more uh, detail here uh, about halfway into the discussion, but I'm just going to plug it right quick. Um, September the 14th, we have the Christ Consciousness um, conference coming up. So it's going to be awesome. Make sure you guys check that out. Go to Christ dash consciousness.com and, um, you can get tickets there. So we're going to go into a little bit more discussion on that about halfway through. So I'm going to go ahead and bring in today's guest, my good friend, Justin Caldwell, AKA influence my brother. Welcome to the true seeker podcast, bro. How are you? What is going on? My brother, how are you doing? Oh, I'm well, man. Finding dandy. That's right. That's right. Likewise. We've been talking about this um, for a while, having you on and sharing your story and uh, you're promoting your new album, man, which you just worked really hard on. And, you know, I had some hand in that trying to help you get it promoted and stuff. And so I was like, yeah, we're going to do it. But time flies, bro. It's yeah, been it four months, right? I think it's especially been like four months. Busy. That's all right. Especially when you're busy, man. Yeah. You know, you got so much going on, man, and so many things, you know so if you don't book it you don't book it and you don't do it it just gets pushed back so it's like look let's do it spur the moment we we uh went uh this past weekend to vortex springs with the fam and you came with us man we had a blast dude it was so much fun we did, we did. that water was cold <laughs> oh it was beautiful yeah, it was it definitely was so dude i want to get into your story um just some of the deep weird stuff you know my i think the audience here likes weird stories and i know you got a bunch of them you've yeah. got some some horror stories and we also got it, it you know it has a happy ending it's a story of redemption and things like that so i want to talk about both sides of that um for those of you who don't know there's some of the stuff that we have together like what how many songs do we have together man i know we have on my end we have um on the seer no 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 on uh the uh colors oh. album we have uh Anahata Sacred uh, Heart Space, which is a beautiful okay. song. We have Praise, and then yep. we've done done two on your projects. One's unreleased though. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's right. Um, well, yeah, and you know that um, the one that we did, Walk Alone, man, that was uh, that was very good. I got a lot of feedback on that. A lot of people enjoyed that one as well. And 
Yeah, walk alone. Yeah, yeah, so if you got if you um I know we have a lot that the Lord has for us in store for the future, like this like this show we're doing, for instance, that's gonna be great, man. I'm looking forward to that. That's gonna be definitely gonna be great. And, uh, yeah. And, uh, so um some of some of these uh stories you're gonna talk about today, they're kind of like sprinkled throughout the album as well, right? Like I don't know. Would you call your, your your new project? Is that a Christian rap album? I know you're a Christian, right? But would you necessarily yeah. call it a Christian rap album? Because you're, you're talking about um, all, all of this spiritual warfare and things like that. We're going to talk about today, right? I would I would say um, I would say that not necessarily um, Christian um, album, more or less than an inspirational, um, motivational hip hop album that's based on the foundations and principles of God. You see what I'm saying? Um, it's quite easy to call it something uh, like, like say, this is a Christian album. And then there's a whole group of people I'm trying to reach that don't even believe God that are struggling in these in these areas. Right. That just by that word alone would be um, they'll reject it. You know, yeah. um, never would I deny that I'm, I love you know Jesus Christ and my Lord and Savior you know, to the death and beyond. But at the same time, there's a certain approach, I believe, that we have to take um, when, as artists in music whenever we're trying to um when we have a certain goal in mind you see what i'm saying and uh, my goal is and my music is to inspire and uplift people that have been in struggles and in many years of addiction many years of prison many years of uh you know just abuse and things like like spiritual mental abuse you see what i'm saying and i try to touch on a lot of them subjects on on my album while at the same time giving glory to the one that set me free from the many years of trials and tribulations one of the uh, deeper tracks, I mean, there's, I mean, all of them are deep. I don't think there's any just fun, playful tracks. Most of them are just deep, heartfelt testimony type stuff coming out of the struggle. But now where you are now. But one of the, the, the main ones on there is kind of what we titled this episode, uh, which is entitled Pharmakia. And it's talking about cooking dope. It's talking about running through the woods on uh, staying up for five days like crazy. Ooh stuff and i i really want to i really want to get into it and go down those paths because on the show especially a lot lately we have a lot of christians on here and we've been talking about the glory realm and been getting caught up with god and ecstasy and ecstatic encounters with god and the euphoria of the presence of god washing over you and traveling to heaven and having beautiful dreams from god but there's an there's a an opposite end of that spectrum as well, where you're having dreams from Satan himself. Right. And, oh, uh, and, and you're, you're just, you know, in, in a, in a realm that's you're, you're interacting with demons and you're entertaining them and you're letting them in, in your aura. Um, talk a little bit about your song Pharmakia and we'll just dive into it, uh, head first. Sounds great. Well, there's so many ways I could approach, um, any of what you just mentioned, but, I would say with the song Pharmakia, I tried to hit the highlights of what, what you said earlier, like the horror stories. I tried to hit the highlights in that, um, you know, when I started off, um, when I started off doing, you know, music, it was, it was crazy because I was actually in my mess. You, saw, you see what I'm saying? I never did try to promote it or anything like that, but I would literally, I would, uh, I would write music and I would go through things and, and I would, I, and I knew that one day maybe I would, I would pursue that. But until that time, methamphetamine had me, um, it had a grip on me and it had had a grip on me since I was 13 years old. You see what I'm saying? Um, started off great, loved every bit of it. I mean, you know, formed memories and it seemed like everything was going to go good. When you're a kid, you don't really see going forward. You know what I'm saying? But, um, what ended up happening was like, like with this song here is, um, you know, I said, I wake up with this dope. I go to sleep with this dope. I'm cooking every other day. It's just the way that I cope. It's become a way that I started to cope with how I lived life. It becomes something that if I didn't have, I wasn't normal. You see what I'm saying? Um, which is a scary place to be because that's such a strong drug that whenever you, whenever you, um, whenever you get trapped into that, uh, you know, where that's the only thing that makes you feel normal. When you get trapped into that, you you've hereby stepped off into a spiritual battle. You see what I mean? And that song is literally hitting on all the topics of how the same way you would fast for God and you would pray and yep. you would see his face is the same way I was doing, like you say, for the opposite, but I would stay up for days at a time and I would inject this drug into my blood vein and then I would inject and you would body's arm that would allow me to, you see what I'm saying? And it caused a pattern of me not only being um, corrupted myself, but being the corrupt door. You see what I'm saying? 
And, um, and that song touches a lot about that as well. And how, you know, how it had its grip on me and how I would literally see the spiritual warfare. You see what I mean? Literally see the spiritual warfare. And it got so deep to where, you know, people call it, I would say, I would say people call it shadow people. You know, that's pretty popular, you know, in the drug game or whatever. You see you're tripping, you're seeing shadow people. But uh, I never really believed that. Even even in my mess, I always was uh, a man of, of faith um, in my heart, you know, even though I ran from it. But I, I literally would dance with these demons and I would see these demons. People call them shadow people, but I would see them and they would talk and they, and they would talk to me. And it was crazy because the way that they talked to me was like they would lie and it would make me feel like it was me talking to me. You see what I'm saying? Like they're motivating me to do this. Oh man, that's just you saying that. They put a disguise. Yeah, like a while, familiar spirit or something, right? Exactly right. And then the, with this disguise, they would lead me to do things to where my conscience and, and, and what I had, what I thought of, I've done it for so long that it didn't even matter. You see what I'm saying? It no longer even mattered what, whether it was me or whether it was, or, you know, I was being like demon possessed. But I can assure you this that. Anytime that you spiral down that path and that you, you stay, you do this poison and you inject it. And matter of fact, you cook it. That's another we'll, we'll touch on that. But whenever you're cooking this drug, yeah, um, you know, you're mixing, you're mixing potions, man. You're mixing, you're mixing chemicals that are, and I believe this with all my heart that when you inject these chemicals, you're mixing, you're, you're injecting them demons. You are literally, you know, the demons will infiltrate in your body. When you do that, you know, it's just a drug. It's just that, no, you know, the enemy wants us to believe that. I believe with all my heart. He literally wants us to believe that. But, and then he'll come into the skies of drugs or whatever, you know. But in my case, it, it was it was the meth. And there was there were so many times, like in that song that I even mentioned, you know, I said, um, I was scared to look at my own reflection because when I looked at my own reflection, I didn't see me. I seen whatever had, whatever possessed me. Mm-hmm. You see what I mean? When I looked, it wasn't me. But once again, get high enough, all that doesn't matter. You know what I mean? Because I'm good. It's just it's just the drugs. I'll get right one day. But really, it's a slow decay, you know? But yeah, with that song, like, it's it's literally for anybody that's been down through that road and that's experienced that, uh, that I'm not going to say just meth as a whole because I did a lot of stuff, but you've experienced dabbling with all that, then, then you can honestly, you can see that, you know, it's, there's way more to it than just drugs. It's a spiritual warfare we fight. It's not just drugs. And that's what that song is touching on, on yeah. overall. Yeah, yeah it's that. not it's not just meth. Meth is a big one. Um, heroin addiction, opiate addiction, sub, suboxone, trying to come off of hard dope. Like, there's so many. Uh, there's so many, man, and it, it will kill you. Like, it will turn you into, uh, I have family members who, uh, they're they're not them. It's like the walking dead. You wow. know what I'm saying? Uh, yeah. right, that are on it right now, and uh, it'll make you do stupid stuff, right? Stuff you would never do. Um, so the name of the song is Pharmakia, and that's what we've titled this episode. We know what that is. For people who don't know what that word is, Pharmakia, touch a little bit on on what it means. I know it breaks down to the Greek that it it's the word for uh, sorcery is where we get the word sorcery, but the the word Pharmakia breaks down from the the it is the greek word from our english word or latin translation pharmacy Pharmacy. the drug and pharmaceutical companies are practicing in a form of witchcraft and sorcery when they are cooking up and breaking down molecules creating new substances that are getting people addicted and all of this kind of stuff so what where, where does that go for you as far as like the whole pharmacy side of it and, and it being sorcery and witchcraft like you said literally it's, it's injecting yourself with demons opening up portals to the other side you know those type of things yeah well with me whenever i i learned to uh when i learned to cook dope when i learned to manufacture it you know i learned it several different ways but in that process and it was a sl- now it was a long time before i ever had this revelation in my head what what i was actually doing what was going on but um I literally, and I can say this with all my heart, literally seen the pattern form into where when I would cook the drug, I would I would do it, I would get high, it felt good, I would give people the drug. You see what I'm saying? But the more that I did that, the more that I continued to to mix these potions 
it became something like an agenda I had on my mind with what I was going to do. I'm going to mix these potions. I'm going to, I'm going to create this substance in order to brainwash these people to give me money, in order to brainwash these people to give me sex, in order you see what I'm saying. I'm yeah. just being I mean, just being honest. And and that's and that's what it ended up being. I knew that if I can mix up this chemical, I can literally brainwash this person if they're willing to do just about whatever I wanted them to do. And that become more of an addiction than just doing the drug. You see what I mean? Because you feel like you have this sense of power. You know, you still you feel like you have this sense of um you know like yes you just can't be touched because you're making something don't nobody else you know have or or this is different than everybody else's you know and um and for me when i had the revelation and i sat back and i said wow what i'm doing is really no different than what your everyday scientists do in a lab and and justified as it's going to cure something or help something but their agenda is money. They're going to get the money from it. It's going to be something great. We might even get a few side effects off of this particular thing where we can create something good for them side effects. And when I had that revelation and then I started seeing the symbolism with it, you know, behind the symbolism behind, uh, you know, uh, pharma, I mean, behind, you know, the pharmacy, just the symbol itself, you know, you know, the symbol and, and, and it's, and it's so crazy because, that is literally the same thing I was doing. You know, that's literally the same thing I was doing. I was in a, in, in a, in a state of where if I could get this, this and that, and I could combine it into one thing, not only will I feel good, you see what I'm saying, but I'll also make everybody else do whatever I want to because they think they're feeling good, but it's really a slow decay and a slow destruction. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Most definitely. So when you, like I said, you're, we're talking about, you know, walking with the Lord, fasting and praying and getting close to the father, eventually getting yeah. so close. You can see his face, you know, when he's around, you start attracting angels around you and things, you know, you can wow. see your angels yeah. if you're doing a good thing. But on, you know, for that to be true, then the opposite has to be true as well. If you're doing dirt, if you're uh, lying, stealing, cheating, you know, messing over people, you're going to attract those type of entities around you as well. Um, and then just having them around you is one thing. But when you're on that, that stuff, were you, you were using it, like cooking it and using it or using other stuff as well, right? Absolutely. Yes. And Absolutely. so you, you could see into the spirit realm. What were some of the things, because we talked about it even just the other day, just like you being in the woods and you'd wake up and think that you were in another city on some random person's porch. Like, yes. what were some of the weird things that you've been around personally and then you've seen as well? I know you got to, without throwing anybody under the bus, yeah. like, what are some oh. of the, the weird, and and I've heard of, I've heard of just crazy far out stuff, people like, picking their scabs and pulling their eyelashes out. You know what I'm saying? Just on meth and on heroin and stuff, dude, and trying to get the lithium out of their uh, pores, scratching yeah, yeah. their pores to smoke it, and they would smoke it. My granny, <laughs> I don't want to throw granny under the bus, but my granny, she would <laughs> deal a little right. dope. You know what I'm saying? And so yeah, yeah. granny, um, she had this lady living with her, and, and she let her smoke rock once she, her roommate, and right. crack rock and then after she'd smoke all the rocks she would uh be on the ground looking f thinking that she might have dropped a piece and i know that's a that's a common thing thinking it that is. they dropped one so she was picking up kitty litter smoking it uh putting the kitty litter in the crack pipe and smoking it thinking it was a piece of crack and another guy i'm not gonna say his name really close to me um he would go to uh the, the local drug dealer's house and they'd buy crack and they go home smoke it they buy some more and they would steal stuff and bring it to the guy and just all night just wow. go, go get crack wow. smoke it and then break into somebody's house take stuff bring it to the crack dealer get some more eventually the dude said they was just going get little pieces of soap and they were selling them soap and they would go back and smoke like doves little pieces of dove smoke, uh, soap because they had just been up for so long and they would just just fiending you know what i'm saying and like just weird stories like that what are some of the stuff you've heard that th this kind of stuff has made people do and that's if that's not demonic in nature i don't know what is all right so what you just said you hit on every subject of my life pretty much at an earlier stage before the meth ever took place me and 
the closest, I'm not going to say nobody's name, but the closest woman in my life, really, but the exception of my wife, we went through that. And, um, and we did the exact same things you were talking about. Literally, we would stay up and we would, we would do the drug together and we would go out and out. We would either steal, we would, we would get it however we could. You see what I mean? But to me, in, in doing, in do, while I was doing all that, to me, that was just a precursor of something way more that was that I had in store for me. And like I say, so there's so many different stories I can tell you, but I'm going to tell you some of the craziest things that I've ever seen. And um, one particular was, it's the same thing that I was telling you at uh, at the Springs this past weekend. We were, um, me and uh, me and my uncle were actually out and he was living in a place called the Funiac Springs, Florida. All right. He lived in Florida. He was cooking his drugs. I lived over here in Alabama in Mobile. I was cooking my drugs. He come over here to visit for Hurricane Katrina. It was Hurricane Katrina. He came over here to visit. And when he came, he, uh, he had, you know, he had a little bit of drugs or whatever. And uh, so once he finished up, once he finished up, uh, once the hurricane came or whatever, and, and we done up all his dope. Also, too, mom says you can tell him. So she said, <laughs> it's I cool. You, would. you know, she's tuned in. <laughs> she wouldn't want to yeah. miss this. But no, so um, I'm going to pick up right where I left off. So, um, so he comes over here and uh, it's Hurricane Katrina. And him and I, uh, we, we do up all his dope. We do it up, you know, and, and, you know, we're high. My tolerance at, I was probably age 20, 19. Been doing it already at that time, not about eight years already at that time, you know. Been doing it a long time. It, it was a slow process. But when we finished that, he wanted to go back to Florida once the hurricane passed. And when we went back, at, by that time, we had been up for a few days. And um, I, re I literally remember sitting in the car with, uh, with my uncle, while we was consuming, you know, this, we was eating it. We was actually eating the dough, right? And, and, uh, <laughs> eating it. We was eating it, yeah. That's well, another look, crazy thing, huh? Hey, well, let me tell you, man. You went, When you burned up, I didn't shoot back then. This was before I ever got into shooting. Yeah. He's like, I ain't going to shoot it. I'm just going to eat it. <laughs> just gonna eat it yeah. And we would eat it. And But my thing is, is I didn't realize how much I had ate. Okay. Now, <laughs> I had let, like, I had let, man, it's crazy. I had let one too many of them up. Uh, I've let two, one too many of those of those uh, demons, I would say, enter me at that time. But anyways, they came into me, and uh, I started feeling like I don't know, uh, probably like something like an ecstasy pill, maybe. But I started getting these illusions, like LSD, and I started getting so far out there that Greg was no longer my uncle; he was an enemy. Yeah, he was. He was an enemy. I he heard was, about he that actually, a lot. A lot yeah. of people having that. He was an enemy, right? And so. Um, he was with his girlfriend and they, we, they were sitting in a little hammock and I remember just, I remember running up to him and then I, I, I tackled through him and I jumped over um, the hammock where his girl was at and then I stood back like this and I was like, I really felt like I was fixing to get into some real like war zone type thing. I mean, this is like serious. I know it's, it sounds funny, but it's yeah. true. Either and me or him. Knew, uh, exactly. But I was in Defuniac Springs, Florida in the middle of the woods. If you're familiar with Defuniac, there's some deep woods out there. And he just so happened to have a spot right in the deepest spot. But I remember running off in the woods. Hi. I said, I got to get away. I got to get away. And the further I ran in the woods, the deeper that I got caught up in my own mind. You see what I'm saying? The deeper that I got caught up into where, wait a minute, what, where am I really at right now? Hold on. Wait a minute. I didn't even know where I'm at. Then I started just telling myself I was at certain places and I would be there. So I said, I must be back home across the street in the neighborhood where I used to live, right? So I remember this. I remember going up to people's houses. Like it, I would go and there would be like a little house in the woods and I'd run up and I'd knock on the window and knock on the door. And luckily, nobody came out and shot me. Nobody even came out. <laughs> yeah. you know? But they came out. And I would take off in the woods because I said, oh, man, that ain't, that ain't who I thought it was. And then it got so bad, man, to where when I looked up, there was – Hell, I literally felt like I was fighting in like a war. You see what I'm saying? Like maybe the Vietnam War because it was gunfire. And I seen a friend of mine that's no longer alive was running up to me along with another buddy of mine. And they were coming to help me. Nobody was there, but they were there. You see what I'm saying? The sleep deprivation had took over to the point to where I was so in like just like, I guess it would be a form of psychosis maybe. Yeah. Or, yeah. you know, or yeah. something like that. 
uh, but it, it literally took me to a place to where I was I was lost in this in this place in the funia, didn't know where I was. And that whole night went on. I was running through cow fields. I was running through bushes. I was getting cut up with thorns. Man, I had blood all over me, cut up. And um, and that went on for the rest of the night, from what from all I can remember. But when I woke up the next morning, the little sleep I got brought me back to my normal me. Um, well, a little bit of my normal me, enough to realize where I was at. But um. This lady, I remember getting woke up to the police and it was shaking on me. And they're like, son, he's like, he's like, what are you doing on this lady's porch? And she's like, baby, just give him a sandwich. Don't take him to jail. <laughs> he said, he needs something to eat. I said, yes, ma'am. I give do. him I some him, milk. Give him some milk. And look, I'm sitting here thinking in my head, I'm thinking like, okay, well, first of all, where am I at again? Because when you've been up for days at a time, that's the first thing you ask yourself when you wake up is like, what all happened these past seven, eight days? Okay, cool. But then I realized, I said, wow, I'm in Florida. I said, and I was like, no, I was underage at that time. I remember because they had to call somebody to come pick me up. Now, I remember that. I was like 17, I think I was, 17. And um, anyways, that they, they felt soft and they took me back to the, um, they took me back to the headquarters where, and, you know, then a uh, family came pick me up. Well, my grandfather come pick me up. Um, and, and that was just, that was just one. That's just one of the things that happened to me. That was, that's the one of the only times in my head that I have ever been so far out of my mind that the, my own people that I love and recognize weren't even the same people no more. You know, yeah. you see what I mean? They weren't even the same people. And, uh, and my thing is, is after that, all that did was, was just make it to where I was even deeper in the game. Cause now my, now my tolerance, now I've done seen it all. I felt like I've done all this stuff and, done everything um and and it couldn't get no crazier than that well the next what 12 years it went on like that you see but um there was a time there was times when i would i would be cooking these drugs or i would be i would manufacture we would get we would get um people together yeah we would get people together and they would uh we would all sit around and we'd get high and we would all like just do random, just crazy things, you know, and we would do stuff that normal people wouldn't do while they're on it, you know, but there was spe- spe- uh, specific times whenever I would be, I'd been up for days and we would be, uh, there's a, se- there's a second process to the, to the dope. I'm not going to like get into detail about all that, but it's where you actually turn the, the drug and the, the liquid into a, a powder form and you to consume it. Cause you know, you can't drink, you know, ether, <laughs> it ain't going to do no good. It'll kill you probably. But once you, once you turn it over to a uh, consumable form, then, then that's whenever you can do it. But I remember a time that I was, uh, I was, I was, I was smoking the dope off, and we were sitting there, and uh, as I was, I was, I was smoking the dope off. My cousin was with me, man. It was a weird vibe in that house, man. And and I believe those weird vibes. I believe when you've been up for days at a time, you you heighten your sense of awareness in a way you 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 can you can literally, you can almost feel that somebody's going to come pulling up to your driveway like 10 minutes before they come i've done it i've yeah. done it man and and, and 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 i could never argue that point with nobody and and then convince me otherwise because I've, I've literally done it literally thought things right on up you see what i mean well we was we was smoking this dope off man and um and this is just something that was pretty cool i'm gonna throw this in there because this was very cool and what i'm telling you is, is, is as real as this podcast is right now you and i talking we um we was we were smoking the dope off and uh, been up for days, man. Uh, but as we was in the middle of it, I heard a loud thump. The boom! I'm like, man, what is that? And, uh, and I look and I see a, a book had fell off of the, um, a book had fell off of the um, the dresser, man. And, and, and even to this day, I get, I get chills thinking about it. But I went up to the, I went over there and I looked just to pick it up and put it back on the thing. Right in the middle, I didn't even finish what I was doing. And when I got over there, it was a book on interdimensional demons in spiritual warfare, I believe is how that was pronounced. It was something interdimensional in, in, in spiritual warfare. You see what I'm saying? And that was very, very odd because it all like hit me kind of like, wow, this like yeah, I'm fighting things. I would always run from myself. I used to I said in the song in Pharmakia, I said, uh, always running from my shadow because I thought it was a ghost. Literally, I would 
be walking in my house and then I would speed up and I would go hide. I get in a room and I just felt like something was on me. Something was just like right on my back and it was always watching me, you know? And the more that I did the dope and the more that I stayed up, the more that it became like just like an everyday thing. And it no longer was fun. When I started off doing it, it was fun. We had a great time, I thought, and it was a slow decay. It was, it was a process of me literally getting into to where I was, um, I was no longer me. And I was fighting against me and these demons, you know, and these spiritual war, these entities, these things that were trying to take me out. But I was working with them in order to do that. You see what I mean? And um, and and it was it was constantly it was like that. I would I would I would do it, then we would stay up, then it was repeat the process, do it, stay up, experience some crazy things, and then repeat the process. And uh, and it just became it became a pattern, man. And it was. It was it was a sick thing, man. But I really thought I was gonna die doing it. I guess you could say I really thought that it was that was gonna take me. But I was willing for that to happen, and I didn't really mind because of the fact that you know I felt like I was what I was meant to do. I felt like that's what I was you know meant to do. I, that my life would just amounted to that. Yeah. Um, but I also at the same time in my heart of hearts knew that if something was coming against me at this rate of speed and something that's coming against me this significant that there's got to be something more that I'm called to do. Yeah. Something's trying to take you out for a reason. There's opposition for a reason. Look, man, we're going to go to a quick commercial break. I'm going to uh, play these quick commercials. And it, one of the commercials is our event that's coming up. I'll play that. We'll talk about it on the other side. Um, I've got some more weird drug stories that I've heard about and experienced myself. I want to hear from you. We also got some questions from the chat. If anybody has any questions, let us know, and I'll try to translate them over to Justin. But we're going to take this quick commercial break. We'll be right back, guys. So the Encountering Jesus, the Hem of His Garment meditation, man, if you guys are familiar with the story in the Bible with the woman with the issue of blood, you're pretty much coming at it from her perspective. So you're translated back to ancient Jerusalem 2,000 years ago and you're walking through the streets. Now there's ambiance, we have voice actors and all of these things as you're encountering people walking through the streets. And as you're moving through the crowded streets, there's things on the left and on the right, they're trying to get your attention. There's vendors trying to sell you things. There's groups of ladies that you meet who are trying to pull you off the road. They're trying to gossip about you. You see all of this stuff going on, but you see Jesus straight ahead. And you're just trying to focus on Jesus with all of these different distractions that are coming. And the different distractions that I put in there were something that God uh, translated to me that people were dealing with. And some of it was stuff that I have conquered in my own life that I was able just to kind of start rolling with it when the Lord told me to go there. But it's dealing with gossip. It's dealing with slander, backbiting, inconsistency, and getting pulled off the path. So as you're going through the meditation, you're being ministered to for some of these areas in your life that we've all struggled with. So again, you're pushing further. You see Jesus ahead of you and you just know that all you got to do is get close to him. Everybody's fighting for his attention and you just know you just got to get close enough just to say hello. Just close enough. If he can see me, I just got to touch him. And so you go in and I don't want to give it away, but you go in and you encounter the love of Christ. You encounter Jesus. He ministers to you. And it's just this beautiful encounter that you have. And it's about 16 minutes. But as you have this encounter, I've also created these meditations so that you can just kind of keep going. As you go in, you're already deep into the trance state. You can kind of keep going with the encounter. So the music continues to go for an hour. So there's testimonies about people who are going in and they're encountering Jesus, they're encountering God, they're encountering angels, and really just getting downloads from the Father's heart for their self. So I urge you to check it out, the Encountering Jesus, the Hem of His Garment meditation, and I guarantee that you'll be blessed from checking it out. A new sound is springing forth. Join us for the Christ Consciousness Conference in Mobile, Alabama with Truth Seeker, Justin Caldwell and Gothic Mystic, 
September the 14th at 6 p.m. at the Mobile Center for Spiritual Living. Musical performances, teaching and lectures, sound and color healing, activation and impartation, meditation and trends, dream interpretation and symbolism. A time of refreshing, prayer, meditation, teaching and activation. All are welcome to attend regardless of religious affiliation or spiritual background to encounter the presence of God in a deeper way. Get tickets and register today at Christ-Consciousness.com. We look forward to seeing you there. All right, so we're back. Um, y'all heard y'all heard the man, Christ-Consciousness.com. You can get tickets for the event. Uh, let's talk about the event for just a, a moment. Um, really need to talk about it at the end because the I mean the person who's playing the piano there is is Justin Caldwell. So influence so he's going to be at the event with me we're going to be doing some music together some uh some of our songs um also he's going to be leading uh instrumental worship so in a time of prayer and meditation justin prophetically plays the piano spontaneously and uh and the glory of god shows up and so if you just tap into the presence so that was him playing over that i'm excited for the event man um do you want to say anything about that before we jump back into the stories man it's going to be Great. I, I was actually listening to that particular piece, and uh, that particular piece is it's, it's got a lot of meaning because it's something I, I learned that particular piece while in the middle of my darkest. You see what I'm saying? So it's got a lot of meaning how, how that's been brought to the light. And that particular piece that was done in the dark has brought a lot of people, you know, helped a lot of people, you know, feel the presence. But yeah, it's going to be great. I'm looking forward to, um, you know, to just. Um, to play a man and, and, and administering, ministering through the music is going to be good. I guarantee you that if you're at that place and and if you're at that place and you're ready to receive something, you're going to receive it. I promise you. Well, there's no even there's not a doubt. If you're in here and you're watching right now, I promise you're going to receive something. You do not want to miss this. Yeah, it's going to be good. Definitely. Um, you uh, find what you're looking for. We talk about it all the time. You find what you're looking for. If you're looking for evil if you're looking for the wrong doing everybody's doing if you're nitpicking people and tearing them apart you're gonna find it if you're looking for whatever you look look for you find and so this is an event where all of us are for the most part as far as i know versus the people who who don't know yet they're gonna get to find out but we're looking for an encounter with god man we're looking just to love on god share our stories to get into some deep teaching about how how good he is and how deep and complex we are and how we receive his love so i'm looking for that you're looking for that. And there's people who are going to be traveling from all over looking for that. So when we come together looking for that, there he is in the midst of us. So it's going to be good, man. I'm excited about it. And uh, yeah, so Christ-Consciousness.com. Check out the event, what we got going on. Um, so th we have a question here and a donation from Christy Folks. Thank you, my friend. Uh, she just left a comment. She says, this is one of my favorite podcasts right right here, only because it is so similar to my experiences. I'm almost having flashbacks right now. So thankful I made it through the lessons learned. A lot of people don't make it out. You know what I'm saying? And some somebody said, you're lucky to have made it out. And then says, no, you're blessed to have made it out. But she wants to know, um, did you ever have any, um, near death experiences where you almost died, uh, maybe physically or maybe on drugs, like where you may have taken too much and have done the mullet, lose control of your body? Like, have you ever had any, any of those or been around people who are overdosing or whatever, mm. or just done stupid stuff, walking into the interstate while they're on dope, like all that I think all of that's kind of a form of near death experience and wow. it all has happened. Yeah. But what about you, man? Well, that's so good because, you know, I've literally have so many things that in my head that, that it takes them kind of questions to really make me remember things. Cause there's so many of them. You see what I'm saying? And, um, but yeah, with me personally, um, I did overdose one time. I was, I was, um, I was doing, hold on. I was shooting meth, been up on meth, and I tried to bring myself down to sleep by shooting K4 Delata. And um, I, I literally, I had died. Um, very few people know about that. The person I was with at the time, they uh, <clears throat> they um, they tried to revive me. I mean, it was a slow process. They didn't want to call the police because they were scared that something was going to you know, happen to them. 
And uh, I was out for like a day and a half, but my heart was still beating. I was cold. Um, I literally, I, I know that's, I had overdosed. I mean, that's simply what it was. I, I had overdosed, but um, I, I guess I never let go. I just remember waking up and uh, I never been that nauseous in my life. I was, I was so nauseous, you know, and I was just sick. But um, that's the closest that I think that I've ever came to death by overdose. But by certain events that's happened that were drug inspired, like maybe flipping a car and wrecking and running from the police and stuff like that. that I mean, that's very that's that's a very deep story. I don't know if you want to talk about that one. That's pretty deep. It's good now. Don't get me wrong. It's good. <laughs> it's yeah, good. If, you, if you feel like it's worth sharing, man. I mean, I know, like yeah. you're saying, like. You know, and we, you know, we're going to, I want to, I want to make sure that we do this though. Cause like, we're, we're going to talk about some of these stories and some of our personal experiences. That old man is dead. Like the, this person oh, yeah. died in that stuff, right? We're Absolutely. on the other side. That was BC. This is AD. This is after the death and uh, of that person and, and the, uh, the death, burial and resurrection of Christ after the gospel. So we, even when we're talking about this stuff, I don't want it to seem like we're glorifying it, but you need to know how real it is. You need to know that everything isn't just love and light. Like as we're just in uh, our puffy and our, our heads are in the clouds, there's people who are really still going through this. And sometimes when you're in the glory, when you're on this side of the cross, that person gets further and further away and years have passed and you almost forget about the struggle. You forget what it's like to be, have demons speaking to you in the middle of the night. You forget about that person going through that stuff and it becomes about, your family, your career, like this side, and you just like, man, something we have to be reminded, man, of, of that, just so that we have that compassion there. So want to um just keep that in mind because you could because there's sometimes and we're going to we're going to pray at the end. want to make sure that we pray for anybody who's going through this stuff. But sometimes when you talk about it, you feel those spirits that kind of lurk up and kind of laugh and you feel like maybe they're still there or you feel dirty after even talking about it and you begin to remember your own sin and that's not the person that you are anymore. But we want to make sure that we pray after this because this is this is spiritual warfare. It really is. This is where the rubber meets the road and we're talking about this stuff and they, you know, spirits, spirits want to exist on this side of reality and so they like it when we talk about them, they kind of feel like it's maybe honoring them or yeah, tell them what I did. You know what I'm saying? But we're going to tell you what he did. So hang on, anticipate that because the stories get even better on the other side of the cross. So let, let's go just a little bit deeper on, uh, on some of those experiences, near death experiences and things like that, that, that you've had on pharmacia, sorcery, witchcraft, and these type of drugs. Right. Okay. So, um, I've got one that resonates with me. It wasn't, my near-death experience, that was one of the closest ones I've ever had, like I say, besides the, um, you know, the running from the law and flipping the car. But this one here really stuck out, and it, and it came to me during the commercial. Um, this was a very significant time. This was like almost the crossroads in the pivot point of, of my life with, with the spiritual thing. So I was in a place called Wings of Life. It's a uh, Christian rehabilitation drug treatment center, and it's a, it's a very, I mean, you know, shout out to the Wings of Life for what they do and, 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 and how they, you know, they, they allow, you know, that place to for God to work on people there. It's, it's a great place. But when I got out of prison, I decided I'd go there to try to get the certificate. So when I had these other charges, they would probably not just pop back up on me. If they did, I'd have the certificate. But this is cool. So while I was in the Wings of Life, man, um, I had somebody that's uh, I know very well. Um, they came to me and uh, I said, man, look. I need you to bring me some dope, man. And he's like, man, I can't do that, man. I, I can't do that. I'm like, well, I said, well, I wish you could. He's like, no, nah, I can't. And so uh, it ended up happening is I never did get it. But a buddy of mine that was in there, he uh, he was getting it. He was bringing it in, right? And so we was injecting drugs. We was injecting, I say it all proper. We was actually injecting dope in this rehab, in this, in this Christian rehabilitation center, correct? So mm. as we're there and what we're doing, um, it became like a habit and I would be scared to stay up more than two days because things in a place like that really start getting weird. You know what I'm saying? You really start questioning about, about, uh, ghosts and demons and are they with us? Or can we really see them? Do we have to be in a certain state of mind to see them? Are they trying to kill us and take us out? You know, but while I was in this place, um, the guy was, we was doing the drugs together. We were staying up and they would have service downstairs 
and I would be up for so long and I'd be on this, on the substance, man. And, and it, this is so, this is so crazy, man. I want y'all to follow me now. So I would go down to these services, man. And the conviction was so heavy on my spirit while I'm sitting in a, in, in a spirit filled, you know, body of people that are thirsty for Christ that are crying out and hear me and a couple other guys that are, you know, the darkest things in that place at the time, um, we was fighting these demons, man. And, and, and it allowed me to see a spiritual battle, a spiritual warfare, man. Well, it got so deep as the months went on, we were doing it. We were staying up. We, we thought we was beaten and, uh, and, and, you know, we thought we was literally getting over on this people and we're going to graduate, you know, we're going to get back out to the streets. Well, while we was in there, man, um, Pastor Chris, which is, a, I love that man. He's a man of God, and, and I've mentioned his name, and, and it's, if you know Pastor Chris, that's, I mean, that's a man of God. I mean, he's, he's, I've known him for a long time, and I've, and I've, and he's touched on things that you'd have to know God in order to touch on, you know, whenever you're talking to me, because, because <clears throat> he, the way he resonated with it, he would come up and have these services now, and uh, this is what resonated with me, rather. He would have these services, and they would be, on what is done in the darkness will come to light, not knowing. So I'm sitting there, and as he's teaching this, like it's a sign, it's definitely a sign. As he's teaching this, I would be in my in the word of God, and I would be sitting there high on this drum, and I would be getting revelation from the old testament, from the new. I would be getting this weird revelation high on drum. Now I know this way out of my mind yet still getting these revelations. You see what I'm saying? I was still being like, was getting things revealed to me. <clears throat> but um, after the service, I remember one morning, uh, it was the next morning after the service had happened, pastor had come running up <clears throat> and he, um, he said, Justin, I had a dream about you and about Busby. He's no longer with us. God bless his soul. But he said that, uh, he said, Justin, I seen you it was a prophetic dream. He said, Justin, I see you sitting on at the end of this hallway at this desk, at this table, and then he said, but I seen, I seen Buzz be with you. He said, I seen him with you, but I seen it was a dark, it was dark where he was at. It was a dark, like the hallway was dark. You see what I'm saying? And at the end, you couldn't really see him, but you, he was steady walking down that path. And he said, he said, he said, I don't know what it is, Justin. He said, but I do not tell people things like this unless I feel it in my spirit. Now this man, nobody knew what we were doing in there. We had it. Well, well God did obviously, but nobody, no human knew what we was doing because we had we was covering ourselves enough for that, you know. At least we knew that much. But uh, fast forward a little bit, man, and uh, I ended up uh, having to leave out of there, man. I got I just just I got chased out of there myself. I couldn't handle the conviction of being in a Holy Spirit filled place and being the most you know demonic thing in there at the time. But um, a month later, the guy that was we was in there with and we was doing the drugs with ended up getting shot and getting killed in a drug deal. Um, you know, and, and, and it was so crazy because the first thing that I thought about was that dream that he came up and told us about now, now what I'm saying, I mean, this is real as we are standing here, you know, it, it hit me so hard that there's certain things in life that happen to you, near death experiences, seeing people die, going and driving down the road and seeing a car wreck. And, you know, sometimes you have these, like these thoughts, like, wow. And it makes you think about life a little bit deeper. Yeah. Well, I literally, that was one of those things that, you know, you can't deny God at that point. You, you really can. You can, but you're just lying to yourself because the signs are there. And I know that I was able to do all that dirt and all the drugs in that rehab and see the spiritual warfare and see all the things happening. You know, it was it was this leading up to me being given my life up 100%. You know what I'm saying? Given my life, these were the things that led up to that because there was so many nuggets that I remembered. Like, like God was like literally in my darkest, allowing me to see these things. And I will say this too. Now, this this just makes this just only right because we're on the podcast. But your album was uh, let me see, "Awaken the Fire," I believe it was was out, and uh, I was listening to it, man, and it and it resonated with me very very strongly. And at that time, Brandon had an an album out. Brandon Sanders had an album out as well. And those, and those, I would listen to them and repeat, like literally. I'd be up all night laying on my bed like this. Everybody else is asleep, lights out, and I'd just be listening to this music, man. And I just, I'm just like fighting, you know, in my, in my, in my spirit, man, was fighting. But all this music was ministering to me. The services I would go to would minister to me. They were talking about the very things that I was fighting with. Nobody knew what we was doing. Um, I would walk down 
you know, just the aisle. And I'd get this weird feeling that I had to get away from it, you know, because it was whatever I was feeling was like something good. And I didn't want that, you know. But all this happened in there was like leading up to me, you know, just throwing it up and surrendering, you know, where I, where I just I couldn't do it no more. I mean, it was it was it was wild. It was definitely crazy. And to see him to die like that, it really opened my eyes up because how can you come to me with a dream that you're telling me that you had and it fit the description so perfect, especially now, as I see that, you know, I finally came over into this side of life. You know, my life is that white hallway now. It's not that dark one. But for him to have pinpointed that, you know, um, I mean, spot on. It was it was just it was amazing, man. And that was really an eye opener um, for me, especially, you know, now. And as I look back at it, you know. Yeah, that's and deep, man. Um, got and, and even there's some weird things that happen in those realms. And and it's almost like God's reaching out to you in there because because of his love, because of his grace. I talked about like um, I remember years ago we were smoking pot and drinking as teenagers, um, watch, flipping through the television and um, smoking a joint and uh, put it on this channel and it was like a, it was a Christian channel we didn't know it when they were playing like Christian metal and the song was going off and it sounded like Corn or Manson or something I was like hey this is pretty cool and then yeah. it, it went to the next segment and it's dude there's a car dude come running and jumping across the, the hood of the car say hey hey you there yeah you with that joint yeah i'm talking to you man i want to let you know that god loves you he's got a plan for your life man put that joint down i'm like what <laughs> it's just like wow. you know god, god knows what he's doing man just to line it up for me to see that at that time and it's just like man and then there's just little things man wooing you hey i i'm praying for you hey this that you know um so as far as like the near death experiences and stuff like all right so it could be weird in, in those other realms because there's no such thing as, as space and time right and you right. can feel that and it feels weird um yeah. so I, I heard this story a fr friend of mine told me and it really it led one of my buddies back to god and um they were having a party at uh at his house and all of these people throw big parties and um there was a bunch up there, and only a handful of them, probably six guys, all took LSD, right, at this huge party. <clears throat> Next thing you know, about an hour later, um, everybody's gone except for the people who had done the <laughs> the acid, and wow. um, and they start panicking, like, "Hey, man, I feel funny, man," and they try to like, one of them just kind of throws the thought out there and says, "Hey, man, I I think we're dead." You know, I think we, I think we died. I think that stuff was poison. That's how they get you in your head because you're already on that stuff. And they say, I think it was poisoned. And everybody just starts panicking, thinking of the worst case scenario, right? Uh, they, one of them gets on the phone and tries to call family members and friends, and nobody will answer. And it's just ringing, ringing, ringing. They turn wow. the TV on, and they turned it to uh, TBN, the Christian channel. And there's a guy on there preaching hellfire that you're gonna die and burn in hell for eternity. And then they were freaking out, thinking that they had died. And it, since it was in this place that felt weird, they thought that they were in um, um, purgatory. Mm. That they were waiting to be judged and go to hell for eternity. Because there was everything just felt weird. And a buddy of mine, one of the guys who discipled me, he was in the back room just with the Bible screaming at God. No, God, no. And they're like panicking, freaking out. And it's like that thing, that that led him back to god man you know he's like wow. i don't want that to happen but a lot of people feel that they've died or they have taken too much of these drugs and it but then again a lot of people don't come back they what we call burnout yeah it, they get burned out one thing it burns out is your emotions mm. like being able to process emotions and you get so much dopamine and you get so much serotonin release that you don't even know it's like the instant it's like the the, the rats pushing the cocaine button to just get that instant dopamine or whatever, just to feel good instantly. And there's things in life that we're supposed to work at to feel good. We're supposed mm. to complete. We're supposed to put in a hard day's work so that we can sleep good at night because we've been working hard all day. You know what I'm saying? Versus taking these pills to go to sleep or whatever the case is. I mean, there's so many different workarounds that we as, as humans have created, but they have all these negative side effects, these drugs, right? that have the right. negative side effects because you didn't work for that. So these pleasure sensors in the brain and in the body and the euphoria, 
they're there for a reason. Like, and they yeah. are utilized. We're fearfully and wonderfully made, and we're supposed to be able to tap into them certain type of ways. But it's not an instant gratification. It's not take this ecstasy. You're gonna immediately love everybody, and everybody's gonna love you. You're gonna have all this energy. No. Because the next day, you're going to pay for it. You've de- depleted yourself of all of yeah. the serotonin. You know what I'm saying? All of the, the, the dopamine. So the next day, you feel hungover. You feel empty. Because you've, you, you've like exhausted all of your resources to, to be happy the night right. before. And literally, man, I've heard so many stories of people doing that. And uh, yeah, that's not the way it's supposed to be done. Um, there's another story I want to share really quick. This interests me. A, a friend of mine, he's an old hippie, man. He got born again uh i think in the uh 70s and part of the jesus movement and stuff right while the hippies got born again 60s and 70s all the hippies got born again started going to church but then the pastors were like forcing them to cut their hair because they come in there with long beards and long hair and barefoot and uh they look looking like jesus and the pastors were like tell them they got to cut their hair and they got to talk different and all this kind of stuff but there was like a huge revival it's called the jesus movement and a buddy of mine got born again during that time but he he told me a story that um he was at at his house and he had done a bunch of acid so he's going through his house thinking he's got this leprechaun chasing him through the house with a knife right he he runs to, to his bedroom shuts the door and the thing's trying to get in it's literally hitting his door and right. then up under it, it sticks the knife up under the door, starts slashing back and forth, trying to cut him. Mm. And uh, he done a bunch of acid. He's freaking out. So he runs to the closet, gets his shotgun, and comes up to the door. He's getting ready to open the door to shoot the leprechaun with a shotgun. He reaches up there and opens the door, and it's his dad trying to get in. And he was so zoned out on, right. on the acid and on the stuff, man. He almost, like, shot his dad on oh, acid. Oh, wow. That's yeah. crazy crazy hey, man that is crazy man that's wild man. so I've, I've heard a bunch of stories I've, I've had some crazy experiences man and of dealing with people who were on dope you know and trying to you know crackheads trying to make yeah. you smoke rock and oh, i've seen them beg my brother come on bro give me just a little piece man and my brother used to sell give me just a little piece her her come on man just a little piece you know it's like jesus yeah. you know we used to yeah. you know it's just crazy, man. But anyway, um, yeah, feeling like you're in purgatory and dying. I mean, there's just so many weird realms that that you're in. But um, you you ended up catching some charges and stuff, man. Right? I don't know if it was stealing or they wow. caught you cooking or something. Talk yeah. about and you were facing some. You you've done some time, oh, yeah, yeah. pretty much ser- right, serious time, right? Talk about a little bit about some of the charges that you caught, man. You were facing some time, wow. and um. Oh. You were facing a lot more time. You've done some time. Talk a little bit about that, man. Yeah, man. That's uh, fool, man. I could definitely, definitely come up with some stuff on that one because uh, overall, my time, uh, I've probably, I've done six, six in the latter part of six years. I've probably done almost seven years total. And um, you know, my first charge. Well, I got my first charge when I was twelve years old. I got a charge for shooting into an occupied dwelling. And um, that was my first, that was just like, you know, the preliminary to a bunch of uh, stuff that's that's yet to happen. But I ended up, uh, my first serious charge was uh, trafficking in hydrous ammonia and manufacturing an illegal substance when I was 16 years old. I caught that charge, went to Strickland, went to a boot camp for it. Um, I did about a year in there. Now, when I say six plus years, that's the time I did in prison. That's nothing to do with juvenile. But while I'm in there, man, um, you know, when you're in places like that, you're just exchanging secrets and things, you know, you can learn to, to do to make it better and to do this, that and the other. But we ended up uh, when I ended up getting out, uh, like I say, on the on the possession of anhydrous ammonia and the trafficking. And I got out when I was 16 and I stayed out for a good bit of time. And then I let me see which then I ended up catching a uh, another possession of a. Uh, of a legal substance with intent to distribute. Now that one landed me into prison for a year. And that's in the dates to get the dates get fuzzy. Cause it was, it, it happened all kind of like almost back to back, but I ended up doing that time. And, uh, you know, it's like, I never really wanted to change when I went in. I just wanted to, you know, to just go in and then it be what it is. And then me get back out and go back to it. 
But um, then I ended up uh, this last time. This is what I'm going to go. I'm going to tell you this is crazy. I mean, so there's there's times all of my charges have been class A felonies, either trafficking, um, which I never did get charged with the trafficking because they never could find the evidence on it. But my charges have stemmed from like possession of uh, precursor chemicals, possession of hydrous ammonia. And it's been a pattern for me since I was 16 with that, with the drug, with getting in trouble for that. But um, I remember it. Uh, so this last time I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to tell the story because it's, 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 it's intense. So we was at my dad's house. It's over in Sims, Alabama. We was in his house and uh, I was staying there and uh, the guys came pulling up uh, a young guy. It was two young guys. I mean, it was, we was all young. We still, you know, kind of are, but <clears throat> they was like, man, I need you to, uh, I need you to cook this dope for me. I need you to bust this batch for me, man. I'm like, okay. Oh, uh, I said, well, what's old boy doing here, man? I don't, I don't know what old dude. He's like, oh, man, he's solid, man. His name was Stump. And I remember to this day, I said, yeah, Stump looks pretty solid. You know, never judge a book by its cover. So we go out, and um, I had got to this point in my life where I could cook the dope, man. You could take me to the Walmart bathroom, and I could come out with a sack of dope. Not even exaggerating. You hear me? Not even exaggerating. Um, but Have you done that? Have you went and got the supplies in Walmart and brought it to the bathroom and made it? Have you? No, I've never done that. I've, I've gotten, I've stole every single thing, you know, think, you know, no longer like this disclaimer, but I literally have stole everything inside of Walmart, walked right behind the woods and, and, and cooked it in less than an hour and walked out with a sack, you know, now I wouldn't cook it on a major scale. I wasn't doing, I was a user, you know what I'm saying? I wasn't trying yeah. to be king. And I knew that I love drugs. I love, that's like I said, it was, I was, it was just sorcery. I would love to cook the dope, get this person high, get what I wanted. I would get, uh, give dope for a place to sleep, give dope for money, give dope for sex. It's like I said, but I, I've literally gotten it down to where I could do that in such a quick time. Um, so, but what ended up happening is we ride out down the road. All right. You're familiar with, uh, you're familiar with the Sims there. I know a lot of people won't be, but the Sims, Alabama area, there's a road called Wolf Road. Now my dad lived back there uh, off of Caldwell Road. It's a family owned land. But uh, we ride off and uh, we get all the stuff and we're in the car and I'm mixing it up and I'm getting it all together and pouring this, that and the other. And uh, I'm excited, man. I'm like, yeah, we're going to get high, man. I've I've been needing something for a minute. And as we go, and I I did the second part, turned it into powder and we're going back to the house to do it. I had the dope in my hand. This is just keep this in mind. I had the dope in his hand. Gripped it. Well, nobody going to get it. I did the first shot. Then I decided what happened after that. That's just it was just a weird pattern that I was stuck in my ways with. Um, so we're on the way back to the house, right? And we pull in and, uh, and this is the charge that got me where I did the most of my time right here. But anyways, we're pulling in and my dad lived down a long dirt road. Like there's woods on both sides of the cemetery, which had a lot of crazy experiences down this road. Right. But as we're pulling up to the house, dude, there's cops, there's sheriffs, there's sheriffs everywhere. I said, turn this, excuse my French, turn this SOB around. You know what I mean? Now, and he turns around, but when he turns around, cops look back and they all point this way, okay? So kind of a dumb move. Would have been smart would have just to pull on in and then to sit down, you know, go in there and walk in the house, you know, everything would have been good. Now, I turned around and I knew as soon as we started running, they were behind us. They were behind us and they were just coming up on us quick. Now, we was in a 1996 thunderbird now if you know anything about them them 96 edition thunderbirds they haul tail they they get up and they go you know well we was uh we was on a high speed chase at this point we're going down the road and we're i mean we're flying down the road man i'm so we was going 95 miles an hour in a 45 you know easily well as we, we kept on going we kept on going and uh we hit the curve now there's um you might be familiar with uh with uh 98 they call it bloody 98 right there yeah. you know 98 yeah. runs all the way down well it runs into a thing called mccrary well we was hitting we was going so fast we couldn't stop that was not an option we literally ran the red light turned right and then we was headed towards mgm school you may you know a mary g montgomery we was headed towards mary g mm-hmm. and as we was going down that road i'll never forget it to this day in the in the newspaper article they said that they were weaving erratically in and out of traffic um, and it was too threatening. They had to call the pursuit off. What ended up happening is they laid the spikes out because there's a police station right behind this school. They laid the spikes out just like you'd see on TV or something. And he go, dude, the dude's driving like, like, like Jeff Gordon. He's driving that car. You know what I'm saying? And the dude in the back's crying. He's crying. I'm like, dude, I said, well, what you, 
I said, that dude going to tell everything if he gets caught. Don't, <laughs> you don't need to get caught. You know what I mean? Don't get caught. And I said, I looked back. I said, man, what are you doing? I said, you need to tighten up. And, I, of course, I was cussing, carrying on. And I looked over at him. He's like, what do you want me to do? I said, just keep driving, man. And we went around the spikes. We kept going. And there's a road called Siebert right there. It's, it's like maybe uh, not even a quarter of a mile past the precinct. Okay. By then, they had done put the helicopters in the air. Now, literally, now this is just like something you would see on a movie. You know, these are the things that, you know, I know God has a purpose for me because I'm still alive. You see, but you talk about near death experience. This is what I was, this is how this is interacting with that question. I said, turn right on Seabird. Now, we were going 90 miles an hour. You don't turn right going over, you know, 15, 20 miles an hour. He turned right and the car flipped. When it flipped, I literally mean it flipped like maybe three flips and then it, it landed right into a police trailer. Those little bitty like hitch ons, you hitch on to the back of a truck and you carry horses in. We And man, I got literally like, here's your dashboard. Like, let me see which way you're looking. All right. So here's your dashboard, my legs and all my body. I was in the passenger seat, got jammed up underneath it. My face slapped off of the, uh, off of the airbag. Cause the airbag, it came out, but the plastic is what hit me. I'll never forget it. And my nose, I just felt water coming down my nose, man. I, I was stuck in the bottom of this car. Nope, never left the hand. It was still in my hand. I never let it go. And I remember breaking free. I got up out of it, and I took off running in these woods. Now, and I'm running. I ran so far, so fast, so quick that all I remember looking back, and I hear birds tweeting. You know, you can just—it was—it was crazy. And I looked on my pockets. I made sure I didn't have nothing on me. I had a suboxone strip. Funny you said that earlier. I had a suboxone strip on me, and I had the dope in my hand. Well, as I was running, the road is parallel to the woods I was running in. You see what I'm saying? So I'm back here in these woods. No, I'm back here in these woods and the cops are going, shoo, shoo, and I'm running up this way. They're going to the scene of the accident. They got him. Yeah, they got him. Well, the guy in the back had ran too. I guess he got spooked and ducked off in the bushes. He ended up getting got. But um, I looked across. I got to kind of, when I tell the story, I got to kind of get like like physical with it. But so I look across <laughs> the street. I look across the street and, uh, there's a track team running, you know, MGM after school track team. They're running. You got with them? <laughs> Let me tell you. Yeah, I did. I got with them. I got with them. You know, uh, praise the Lord. Man, praise the Lord. But anyway. I, I, you got blood I, all I, over you. Man, look, this is why I, I may have told you this story before, but I had, um, I was in a wife beater. I only had one sleeve of tattoos. It was just like I had that whole sleeve of tattoos, and I had a little bit forgiven right here. <laughs> I should have had it unforgiven at the time, but it was forgiven, right? And then I, um, Took off across the street. I made sure the cops, I mean, I looked. It was really just a risky thing because I took off across that street with my eyes closed, basically. And then when I got into them, I literally blended right on in with them. And I'm running with the track team. We're running. We're getting it. You know what I mean? And I'm like, who to do? I said, not look like I'm even in school. You know what I'm saying? And we're running. And I look over at this at this person, and um, I'm like, I said, man. I'm like, can I use your phone? And they look at me like. I'm like, oh, Lord, they're going to get me busted looking at me like that. You know, so I can't run. I hit the corner. I went inside the school. Foolish move. Foolish move to go inside the school. But I did. <laughs> there was a sweet little old janitor lady. I'll never forget it. I said, ma'am, I'm bleeding down my arm. Thorns. I had thorns cut up because I was going through the woods like this. Rambo. I'm talking about getting through these bushes, you know. And uh, the lady said, yeah, baby, are you okay? I said, yes, ma'am. I done fell down out there. I scraped myself up. I need to get I'm call mama to come pick me up. I ain't even going I ain't worried about practice. Come up with some excuse, right? About the time I got her phone, nobody would answer. Naturally, nobody was answering. I looked over and the cops were pulling into school. So I said, all right, I'm screwed. Oh, I'm screwed at this point. But keep in mind, the dope that I had in my hand, let me let me rewind. I ended up putting that into an old dead tree stump before I crossed that road to get over there with the track team. You see what I'm saying? Like, I can't get caught with nothing. Possession's nine-tenths of the law. I always knew that in my, in my mind. You know what I mean? But, um. So they literally take me, uh, I mean, I go out and I, I remember walking to the bleachers and I sat down. I'll never forget it to this day, man. I remember feeling a gun here, a gun on my side right here, one on my neck. And then the guys like pushing my head down and they threw me back. And I mean, I was a little cocky back then, you know, I was like yeah. big time. Like I wasn't, I didn't care, especially when I knew I was in trouble. I wouldn't, they said, what's your name? I said, my name's Bob. I mean, we went through it, you know, literally just, I was just giving them a hard time. So they take me back to the scene of the accident okay and uh and while we're while i'm sitting there i'm in the cop car i'm looking back you know they ended up charging me with, uh it was 
it was just precursor at the moment at that time it was just a precursor charge that i got charged with but um as i look back where the police had the, the scene and all blocked off and stuff a car was coming and wrecked into a cop car and almost hit a woman and her kid okay all this has happened at once i said man i started looking for the clouds to just start dropping out of the sky because it was so weird you know it's like how does that happen while all this is happening hmm. it was just weird but anyways so um I ended up going to jail for that, man. I was sitting in there for a long time, and uh, I was facing some, some, some pretty heavy time for that, right? Um, if I would have gotten in trouble, well, all I had was the precursor charges. When we went to court a week later, they had upped my charges to trafficking and manufacturing. Okay, so that's a serious charge. I don't. Well, need how that much did they brother. catch you with to to do that? They didn't catch me with nothing. They didn't catch nobody with nothing. Let me tell you what happened. So the guy that's sitting in the back seat crying that I said he's going to tell everything. That joker stood beside me in the courtroom while the other guy that was driving turned states, turned did the whole nine yards, flipped the script on us. He took them back. He cooperated. Oh, damn. And he showed them everything. everything. Dude, he, he told them everything. He told them what color underwear we had on. Yeah. I mean, it was crazy. But anyways, he goes back to the uh, scene of the accident where I threw all my dope trash away at in the woods. He takes him back down that dirt road, my private little dirt road. He takes him back down that thing and he shows him everything. And so when we're sitting in court, like fast forward now, when I got into court, I mean, of course, it's a, it's a normal thing for people to go to jail and get holier than thou and to read your word. And then next thing Jailhouse you know, religion. Yeah, Reverend Caldwell, uh, Reverend, you know, that's just how it is. You're Reverend. Then you let you learn. Yeah. Jailhouse Spooked religion. you to church. Yeah. Spooked, yeah, exactly. All that. Yeah. You feel like in your head, I'm going to do good. I've been clean for, for three days now. I feel like I can make it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, but I really, I literally got close. Uh, really, my relationship with God was getting—I'm not going to say fine-tuned, but it was getting—it was getting. Uh, I was kind of getting the surface. The foundations were laid, even though I was yet to be fully surrendered. The foundations were getting laid, and uh, I remember going to court, man. This is this is the icing on the cake, man. I remember going to court, prayed hard that morning, man. It's like seems like whenever you're in a position like that, your prayers just have so much more substance because you're truly crying out from a heart. You're not just. You know what I'm saying? A lot of people, I believe, when they when they pray, that it's it's a difference in really calling out, and 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 there's thank levels you, to God. it. There's levels to it. Amen to that. That's perfect. But we're standing in court, and there's Buddy across the way. I've got the one lawyer that everybody says you don't want to have. <laughs> he said, "Hi, B said you go to jail ten years, you come out big man. Women love you. Oh you know, God, that's, yeah." And I'm that like, was I zero. <laughs> that was zero. You know, but look, I set him up for the kill. So as I'm sitting here, the cop is, uh, you know, him and the other dude, I'm looking at that dude. Like I, I never thought about being violent really much in my life, but I really like felt like, like violence in my heart that day. You know what I mean? I really do that toll on everybody. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I really did because it, and it was more so that I, myself that I allowed myself to trust him. Cause the first thing I said is what's old dude doing here? I should have went with that. But anyway, so the judge says, uh, no, the lawyer, my lawyer asked uh, the, the, the cop, this is so good. He says, so, so he says, so you tell me, he says, well, where do you see my client? He said, well, we found him at the school up there. He had rain in the woods. He says, OK, OK. So when you find my client, do you find what do you find on my client? He said, uh, well, I mean, he didn't have nothing on him. He must have got rid of him or something. He's like, OK, OK, OK. He's like, uh, all right. Well, how many people seen the, my client run from the car? I mean, there must be at least one person seen the client run. He said, uh, well, we, the driver, <laughs> you know, the one I was standing on, he's like that. I mean, he, he said he was with him the whole way. He said, Your Honor, so you mean to tell me you can go to Mississippi. You can pick up the normal Joe Blow. You can bring him back to the scene of the accident and say he cooked the dope. He said it makes no sense, you know. And I'm sitting there like, wow, I'm blown away. Like, like wow, this really does make sense because they didn't catch me with nothing. And then and the judge looked at him and said, well, did you find anything on my client? And he, or, or, or did you find anything on Mr. Caldwell, whatever? No, or in my other buddy. No, we never, we never did find anything. He said, why are we standing here? <laughs> he said, this don't make sense. He said, look, I'm going to keep the possession charge on you uh, until you go to court and you can get that thrown out once you go to court or you can cop out today and go home. And they ended up charging old buddy with the stuff they found because he took them to it. They always <laughs> hey. They always say in the game, you never snitch because you don't know how it's going to unfold. You just don't do it. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not in the game. I'm not, you know, with that whole, like, 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 I've never, I've never did. Yeah. You know, I did my time because I didn't. 
but that's not what I'm really getting at. What I'm getting at is that it was so crazy how that panned. That lawyer had, had probably. The dude told on everybody he was telling on himself because they didn't never no, caught y'all with nothing. Wow. They never caught with nothing. That so I ended crazy. up popping out to a precursor charge. Okay. And uh, the precursor charge was, it was something, you know, I mean, it was crazy, man. But I had to get out that day. I was tired of being in there. I was hungry. I was tired of being there. So I copped out to the precursor charge and I get back out. And, um, you know, I, I start, I went even harder. But, anyways, I ended up, uh, they ended up running in my house overall. That was the last charge that I got whenever they swarmed the house. A girl I was with had text meth on me because I was cheating on her with this other girl that was there. It's just part of how the dope, the sick, twisted dope game goes. And they swarmed the house. They laid everybody down. I took the rap. I'm just fast forward to this part. I took the rap for everything because he was asking about the charges and all that and how that yeah. all played a part of my. And this is the, the last charge I ever, ever gave, never will, God's will ever get. But he uh, literally, they swarmed the house. I took this, they wrote a statement on me. Uh, I wrote a statement on myself. So my dad didn't go to jail. Yeah. Nobody went to jail. No, Greg didn't go to jail. None of them went to jail, right? And uh, they ended up taking me. What I didn't realize is I'm a habitual offender. And at that particular time, there was a habitual offender law that says that the only thing you would be eligible for would be a life sentence if you have three or more class A felonies. Dude, I was rocking them class A felony. I had a lot of, you know, like I was getting like it didn't matter. Ended up, uh, ended up facing a life sentence on that man, and doing a lot of time while waiting to go to court for that. That sin that had never came out of grand jury to this day. It sits in grand jury almost seven years now. Sits in uh, in grand jury, waiting. You know, I mean. You know, it would come out, but it's not going to because I know God, I know, I know he covered that. For I mean, I just feel a, a comfort in my spirit. But um, the lady that arrested me, uh, she said that she said, maybe one day you'll get it right. And she slammed the door. Now, this is where it gets good because I want to tell you these nuggets. I don't want to tell you the whole stuff. I don't want to drag it out. Yeah, but it's good. So fast forward, I married my wife. I'm living. I got a life and, and, and you know, just been redeemed full, full of life now. And I'm going to give my uh my testimony, man, this is probably five years past all that crap, you know, well, there's a little, yeah, something like that, somewhere around that time, maybe, but fast forward through, through that, and I'm giving my testimony at a church that Pastor Brian had got, that it was actually his pastor, one not, one of his first pastors before, okay. whatever, yeah, and uh, I give him my testimony, man, and uh, on my way out, me and Lauren give our testimonies, we're walking out, and I feel this lady's hand on my arm, and I look back, and she says, son, do you know who I am? And I looked, and it was the exact same arresting officer that that arrested, that uh, had threw me in jail, or had took me to jail. And it was so crazy because the night before, you may be familiar with the House of Horrors. We with Lauren and I was helping with that, the walkthrough, and you know, explaining mm -hmm. real life horrors. Oh yeah. And a lady come up to me, and she said, Justin, she said, and I never met this lady. She said, Justin, something you've been praying for, and your heart is fixing to come true. It's fixing. It's fixing to show itself to you and you were going to have a peace about it, a comfort about it. And I'm thinking, yeah, we're going to have this house. We was just buying this house. And I'm like, yeah, we finna get the house. It's, it's it locked and loaded. You know, my main simple minded. Then the next day that happens. So not only is it like a peace of mind that I'm sitting here wondering, like if that ever came out of grand jury, that's the arresting officer. She sees my life, you know, how, how my life has changed. Do you see what I'm saying? And, and it, and it would, uh, it would literally impact me in a heavy way because she's the one that's got to press the charges. You know what I'm saying? She's the one that's got to, you know, put it up against me, but she yeah. had a tear. In her eye. She had a tear in her eye that day, man. And, and yeah, there's just so many, man, like stories, but that was the last charge I ever got. Now, if you add all that up, I was facing a life sentence, still in facing a life sentence. It's only by the grace of God that I'm still here and I'm free. You know what I mean? But that's a run through with my charges, man. I mean, and, and to, it just got worse, worse, worse and worse. Yeah. Until I finally finally gave it up, you know. Man, that just that's just how everything comes full circle, man. And, and like the whole arresting officer being there while you're sharing your testimony at some random church thing. So if anything ever came of it, she she knows that you're you, like you've been rehabilitated. You know what I'm saying? You've done your time. You're good. So just that that weight being lifted off of you, man. I know. Man, just how uh, how grateful you are of that, because that was something that was kind of like a dark shadow that just was always there. Keep going, we're we're waiting on you, like those demons. You know what I'm saying? And oh, it's yeah. it's been taken care of by by the blood of Christ, man. So, dude, that's so awesome. But um, yeah, but um, talk a little bit about just how just that of of you 
having that realization, was there like a, uh, was there a come to Jesus moment or was it just something slowly but surely just like just start doing better, start reading the Bible more? Or was there like a one time thing where you felt the light come in and cleanse you and forgive you? Or how how, how did that that happen as far as your, your conversion to uh, being a follower of Christ? And I was waiting. That's my favorite question so far. I mean, yeah, because this is something this is the this is the main thing that I love to testify to. Um, I went back to Wings of Life, the same place I had all them spiritual battles. By the by, you know, Pastor had mercy on me and allowed me to come back for the seventh time. Wow. Never graduated that program for the seventh time. Been to ten five other um rehabs and that one seven times. He allowed me to come back. And when I decided I was going to go back, I said, well, I just want to get the streets off my back. I'm going to give me some food, um, get me maybe another good drug dealer or something, uh, you know, for some weed or, or just whatever I can get my hands on while you're in here, click up and then go back out. Well, God had another plan for me. Um, I had to be willing to accept it. It was wild. So I, I, I faked a kidney stone. I went to the hospital one night. I was about three weeks there. And while I was there, um, I was, they were giving me the lot. It was giving me just everything. I was just trying to get, you know, I was just playing the system, playing the game. And I was sitting there and I was laying it, you know, I mean, it's just, just how addicts do, you know? And as I'm playing the system, they're coming there. I'm like, Oh my God. I mean, I'm playing it off. I ain't even hurt. You know what I mean? <laughs> and they come in there, hold up, sir. And they shoot me with the lot of, and, and all this, that, and the other. But, uh, I remember leaving that night walking back and they had just had a service and that to this day i swear i wish that i could just remember these ladies names that were there it was sister linda and sister jack it was it was two sisters and they were on stage now at wings of life nine o'clock is whenever it's quiet time nine o'clock is quiet time everybody goes up bed the stairs they got 30 more minutes they can just lights out everybody's asleep you got to get up at 4 th- uh, 5 30 morning so that's cool. That's fine. I'm walking in, right? Uh, whoever's over the, over the um, sanctuary that night allows me. They unlock the door, let me in. I got my little bag, my little ibuprofen 800s, and I'm walking by. As, as I'm walking by the uh, stage, I looked over, and I said, man, I'm just going to go get prayed over. I said, I'm just going to pray over. Just pray over my liver. Let's just pray over my liver and my, my organs. You know what I'm saying? Let's just ask God to, do, you know, to heal them because I know I've been beating them up pretty, pretty you know, relentlessly. And uh, so I went up there for a prayer of physical healing, right? I was, I was definitely, definitely like not expecting what was fixing to happen, man. So I go up there and, and I remember I said, I just need prayer. And these ladies, they laid hands on me, man. One on this side, one on that side. My brother HB was right here. And then um, another, uh, another fellow now, um, he was, uh, he's behind me. And they laid hands on me, man. And I just remember I started shaking. It was the weirdest thing. I started shaking like I couldn't. It, my hand was just, I was like, wow. I just really kind of wanted to quit touching me because something weird was happening, slowly starting to happen. And then I just started slowly, like, just, like, just started, like, crying. You know what I'm saying? And then, like, I was, I was shedding tears and I was weeping. And then I was like, what's going on, man? Then I felt on my knees, man. And when I fell to my knees, I've never felt that kind of conviction. It's the only way I can, I've never felt the conviction that had so much love involved with it it was like so intertwined because I'm sitting there and I'm laying there and I'm like lifting up and I'm bawling, dude. I mean, like tears are drip. I was like, it looked like, I mean, it was just dripping, <laughs> yeah. dripping. I'm just holding up and I'm like, God. And I said, I said, God, kill me or make me know you. And I said it loud. I said it loud. I didn't even put yeah. believe it. Yeah. I was like, Oh, and I was like, Oh man, it was crazy to this day. I'll never forget it. And I bawled and I cried, man. And I was laying there and I was, they done got like, Oh, we didn't realize this was fixing to happen. They were, <laughs> <laughs> you know, we've been trying to get somebody to come up here and get saved like this all, all for the past two years, you know? But, uh, no, man, I was at a point in my life, man, where I was calling out to God with a sincere heart, man. And uh, and I felt the presence of God, man. And I didn't – all I did was say, kill me or make me know you. But that 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 was the exact same words as if you say, God, come into my life and save me. It's the same thing, man, because since that day, it was a transformation. But let me tell you what God revealed to me during that. He gave me a revelation. He said that everybody in life, whether it's sin, whether it's doing wrong, that they form, they form this amount of junk in their life, this junk code or whatever, this stuff that, you know, that they establish. Everybody's levels of it is different. What they do is different. You know, some people would live, you know, more intense than others. You know what I'm saying? But everybody's got this sin. And he said, with that, 
Now, this is God's revelation to me, man. I'm, this one, I'm telling you, God gave me. He said that with everybody's level of junk, there's a level of love that's made to fit or to wash out that junk. But the, he told me the reason I gave you your portion was because you were ready to receive it because you had an open heart. He said, I'm not going to give what I, I don't think I'll ever experience that to that extent again. But he allowed me to experience that because I was at a point to where I would use it. I would take it and I would run with it. You see what I'm saying? I'm not going to say, yes, Lord, save me. Okay, cool. No, something happened to me that I was wanting to. And I said, and when he did that, man, that night, I remember leaving, going up, and I was waking people up, man. I said, man, dude, I said, look, <laughs> I'm serious, man. This God thing that they're trying to tell us, man. I mean, I was weeping. I about to sh almost shed a tear just now thinking about it. And I was, my buddy's like, oh, that's good, man. That's good. I said, no, bro, I'm serious, man. I said, you can't, you don't understand the significance of this, man. God is real, man. He loves you, man. And he's like, dude, go to sleep. And I'm like, God, I just wanted everybody. But nobody was, it was made, for, it was just for me at that particular time. Because I was calling out. You see what I'm saying? And, and everybody's time's different, but I believe that God's not going to just give you all of, you know, he, I don't believe that God's going to allow you to experience something so precious unless you're going to do something with it. He knows your heart and your mind. If you're calling out just, just for looks or just for good, you know, or you're just halfway doing it, you know, you, you have to be bare of balls. I mean, excuse me, from balls to the wall, man, calling out for God. It's like, like need, like just hungry and and it changed my life. I went in the bathroom that night and I read the book of Joshua, man, for probably two hours sitting on the commode. I mean, I wasn't like using the bathroom, but I was sitting there because it's the only place I could turn lights on to read. And man, and since then, man, like my life has, has been different. You know, I, I literally changed. I never looked back, man. I was taking, uh, I was taking like these prescription pills while I was there. I gave them up. Um, I slowly started learning about fasting you know, and, and about, and about getting closer to God. Uh, there's times I wouldn't drink nothing, but just like healthy teas. You know what I mean? And have like my oil diffusers and stuff. Like I would try to keep things just real pure and, and like positive in my area, my little, my little area that I had. But God slowly revealed to me things, man. And he gave me a beautiful wife that I love. That's not just my wife. It's my best friend. And he gave her to me. And a, a big reason why I'm still doing good to this day. You know what I'm saying? I know God allowed every, you know, you've heard it said that every man needs, a, you know, there's a good woman for him and that's going to complete him. It comes to complete him you know you see what i'm saying and yeah. when i found her though it was so it was prophetic you know i mean it was the whole way i found her but so all that happened and life hasn't been the same it hasn't been perfect but man i had to look back i ain't went back to doing dope i ain't went back to none of that stuff man that was over six years now and say it was 2013 september september 14th september 16th 2014 that's what it was man Dude, that's awesome. Like yeah. everybody's in just in, in you know what I'm saying, different different places in their walk with God, you know, everybody's in, in different uh places with them. But um you know, so, some people it's hitting home. For others it's you know, they've never heard of this before, right? Yeah. Um I want to. I want to pray, man. Like I said, we wanna pray for, for anybody anybody who's struggling. Again, we talked about essentially demonic possession, opening up gates and portals to the demonic realm. Uh-oh, <laughs> right when I Whoa. said that, I fell off. <laughs> <laughs> I just taped that up early. <laughs> We're going with that. You need to tag it. <laughs> opening up gates and portals to demonic realms, right, through, through many different ways, uh, particularly in your case and many other cases, uh, uh, pharmacia doing uh pharmaceutical drugs mixing them together now this isn't an attack on plant medicines that's a whole nother podcast and we've covered that on many occasions and there's some people in chat but mixing lsd mixing crack cocaine methamphetamines uh oxycontin like all of this stuff like mixing it up to create something that's pharmacia sorcery is where we get the word for sorcery which is witchcraft right um, anybody who's opening up any of those portals through that, maybe they're still lingering. Maybe you're doing better, but there's just still feeling like something's lingering. You never had those doors shut. Maybe it's through other means. Maybe there's other things that you've did. Maybe there's television uh, shows that you've watched or movies that just keeps playing over it in your head. I don't know what it is. Everybody's different, right? 
But for anybody who needs that door shut, the one reason I love Jesus, right? There's many reasons. But one reason I love Jesus is the fact that, uh, first of all, he's the head of all principalities and powers. And all of these spirits, every single one of them, must bow a knee to King Jesus at the mention of his name. He is the first and the last. He's the alpha and the omega. He is the beginning. He is the end. He is the amen. He is the final say so. All of these spirits must bow. So if you've opened, opened up any doors, they can be shut. In the book of Revelation, it says that he opens and closes doors that no man can open or close. And guess what? If you've opened up doors or portals or whatever the case is, or if you've made contracts with spirits, even unaware Jesus has the power to close them. And all we got to do is ask him. All we got to do is ask him. So, brother, by faith, if you're cool, pray for those who have opened up doors to the demonic realms and who are being plagued, even if they don't even know it, because it becomes second nature, like you were talking about. They speak in third person. Oh, yeah, we're hungry. It's a demon speaking. You know what I'm saying? It's like, oh, yeah, I'm. I want this craving. I want to look at this pornography, right? Whatever the case is, you start feeling like it's you, but it's a spirit within you trying to coach you on things to do, things to look at, contracts to make. It gets deep. We can break it down, man. But I do believe in the power of prayer, bro. So if you will, man, I'm going to ask you to pray and then I'll finish it up with a prayer as well, man. Absolutely. Well, Father, Father God, we love you and we thank you. First of all, we just thank you right now for this opportunity to come together, Lord, and and to share. And and right now, I just pray that whoever or or whatever anybody's going through out there right now, Father God, that you come and you give them a piece, their portion of love, Father God, that's going to eradicate that thought, that's going to eradicate that pain, that's going to eradicate that hurt, Father God. I know what you've done for me, and I know you can do it for them, Father. And right now, I also pray, Lord, that you give them a heart that's ready to receive what you have for them, Father God. Father, it's so easy to deny you and to, to justify, you know, that you're not there for us or you're not. But God, I know you are, Lord. And I just thank you for what you've done already and what you're going to do in their lives, Father. And I just pray if it's anything on them, whether it's drugs, whether it's pornography, Father God, whether they struggle, you know, with whatever gambling, whatever it is, whether they're just fighting their own demons like that was similar, like just hard drugs we just ask you right now father lord that you just come and you break them chains off of them lord and you give them you give them a peace lord the peace which surpasses all understanding father god that peace that's going to help them to realize what they got to do lord and give them strong will father god to help them break through those thoughts lord whenever the enemy tries to push them to try to do the wrong thing father god we just love you lord and we thank you for that yes lord yes lord. amen amen god i thank you lord that you'll break every chain god every chain of bondage, every chain of addiction, whoever's listening, no matter what it is, whether they know, whether they can pinpoint where the point of entry was or those who don't even know, God, whatever's ailing them, God, whatever they have going on in their body, in their mind, their psyche, Father, I speak peace in Jesus' name, God, peace, God, to close every door, every gate of entry right now in Jesus' name, Father, God, fill them with your peace, fill them with your love, God, Lord, I believe that light and darkness cannot dwell within the same vessel, God. So we just send forth your light, Father God. Reconcile them back to you through the cross, Father, what you've done. You provided a a way for us to be saved. You You provided a way for us to be set free from any unrighteousness, no matter what it is, God. We bless you and we thank you for it. So right now, we speak to the enemy. We shut the mouth of the accuser, any voices any uh, voices of condemnation tell them that they've done too much to to move forward that they they can't move any move forward because they've done too much right now we bind the enemy in jesus name thank you that we serve the prince of peace so right now god we just loose your peace we thank you for it god it is our inheritance to the sons and daughters of the most high we bless them in jesus mighty name amen and amen man enjoyed it my brother um so people want to follow you on on facebook they want to follow you uh they want to hear your music because everything you've talked about you've this is a you have a whole album about this stuff let them know where they can check it out man if you can see that right there is that too bright it's a little too bright in it we can see it yeah we can see it on the on the podcast end so he's holding up his cd cover for all of you guys listening (laughs) yeah that's it 
But um, but no, you can follow me um on Facebook on my on my on my regular page. It's Justin Caldwell, um, just like it sounds. Or you can follow my music page as well. That's Influence at E N F L U E N T Z. Um, you can look up all my music. It's Life Changes is the album. You can look on all of the platforms, and it's on every single one of them. Um, follow me on Instagram at Influence. Um, spelled with an E, E N, ends with a Z. <laughs> and um, you know, and and just you know, if you want to be a part of something, man. That that's I believe that we work together in this thing, man. Trying to trying to um, you know, work together as as soldiers, man, in this thing that we're trying to reveal truth and give life and, and, and help spread what we've experienced so it would help other people. And that's my mission. That's what I love to do with my music. It's just to to inspire people and to help people. I don't push, I do not push religion. I don't push, I'm not one of those kind of people. I'm just not that guy. I'm not the one for it. I'm just, I love God. I know what he's done for me. Nobody can ever tell me that he's not real and he ain't because I know him. I've seen him. I've met him. I've felt him. Good stuff, man. Well, uh, Justin Caldwell Influence will be at the event on September the 14th at the Christ Consciousness Conference. Uh, it's going to be good. Tickets are only 25 bucks, and we have a whole night plan for you guys. We're going to uh, be doing some teaching, worship, hip-hop music. Um, shoot, we're going to just do this. We're going to do this <laughs> with a lot more people, and it's going to be good. Shout out to Christy, folks. She said she's excited to meet you and wifey when she comes. She's excited to meet your your, your mom, who's been hanging out with us in chat, Deborah. Um, I'm excited to see Christy meet Deborah as well. I think they're going to click and hit it off really good because yeah, they're up, they, they, they both love the Lord with all their heart. So it's going to be awesome to see those guys together. I'm excited for that event and uh, everything else the Lord's doing in our midst, man. And uh, dude, you're a really good friend. I want to thank you publicly for supporting my ministry. You're, you're a patron. You know what I'm saying? That really means the world to me. So thank you for believing in what I'm doing and bringing to the table. And the feeling is mutual, man. And I want to honor you and everything that you're doing. So thank you so much, man. And uh, yeah. Love you, man. I appreciate it, man. It's great. We'll do it again, brother. You know, Let's do we it. definitely will. Ready. Anytime you let me know. All right, brother. Shalom. Peace, peace. Right. Later. Yeah. Check him out on, on online, guys. Influence.com. It's E N. F L U E N T Z. Just type that in on on uh, YouTube or Spotify, anywhere you consume media. Check out his music; it's really good. Like I said, we're featured on a couple songs together on my end as well. One of my favorite songs that I've done on a hot sacred sacred heart space. Um, that's a really good song. Like I really love it, and he's on there. He blessed it with a verse too. So check that out as well. Um, when I, um, I got this in. So I um, I got a letter in the mail today um, I have a P.O. box and sometimes I get letters sometimes I get books and posters and fan art and a bunch of really cool stuff people bless me with shower me with gifts and things you know and uh, I got a letter today and um, I, well, it's not a, it's it came in the mail in, in the disc the P.O. box is in the in the description here if you guys want to check it out but anyway it was an envelope and then this is all that was in it was an old school heaven and hell. I know it's probably backward on your screen. Um, heaven and hell gospel track. And it just goes through and tells you about what hell is and what heaven is and what hell is not and what hell is. Um, it's in, it's interesting. Um, we, we've done a couple shows and where we've talked about hell and I, the closer we get to the love of the father that that thing uh just kind of disappears of, of thinking that there's a god out there who who desires to torment people or um anything like that for eternity because they didn't believe or they had a bad representation of the gospel or who he is so i really don't believe that that uh your eternal salvation is dependent on my uh, ability to explain what God is or the gospel or what heaven and hell is. I don't think that at all, but I do, I do, I do think, uh, thank this person who sent this to me, um, because they really believe in, in their conviction. And I always go back to the video with, uh, Penn Jillette, um, who's a, who's a, a staunch, uh, atheist, uh, kind of attacks the Bible really goes against it. And somebody handed him a Bible at one of his, um, speakings and how he he's in, he said hey he wrote his number in there and gave his name and said uh if you have any questions give me a call i'd love to talk to you 
And um, so I really do um, appreciate this. And, and it's the same sentiment as Penn Jillette says. It's because he said that he doesn't respect any Christian who doesn't proselytize. I don't respect you. If you believe that there is a place of eternal, not momentarily, but eternal punishment and everyone is going to hell by default, like by default, you go to hell unless you hear the gospel or unless you respond to the gospel A really good representation. Your heart's convicted. You move with compassion and you go to church. You get born again. Um, if you believe in hell for all eternity and you don't tell people, you have to be one of the most um, cold hearted individuals who have ever existed. If you really believe in hell, if I believed in hell, I'd probably be stopping traffic. There was a point in time where we did. We did open air street preaching and we believed in it. But I, I thank you for, for this track. If you think that I'm going to hell, right, for all of eternity, unless I repent and, and change from my change my ways. Uh, thank you for sending me this in the mail. Even though I don't agree with it, I do. I am thankful that you believe in it enough that you care about me enough to tell me that I'm going to go there when I uh, leave earth. Um, so, yeah, if you believe someone's going to hell for eternity, you need to be telling people that, right? You need to, I did a video. I don't, I don't really don't either. They're either the Christians of today are some of the most cold hearted people that exist or they don't really believe. Like if I'm, if we're driving off of a cliff, and this is they use an, an analogy like this, right? You're headed, you're driving down the road, but you can't see it. Right around that corner, there's a cliff, and you're going to fall off that cliff. And there's just people who are driving straight off of that cl cliff, and you see it. And you don't run to traffic and, hey, wait, wait, stop, stop. If you don't do that, and you just let people, and you're just like sitting back because you're scared of what they're going to think of you, um, whatever the case is, they're just driving off of the uh the cliff and you're not telling them that there's a cliff there then you're one of the most cold-hearted people and i don't think you know most christians will tell you that they don't tell people about hell because it's not popular they're afraid of what people will think about them all of those type of things so shout out to the people even though i don't believe it my buddy johnny g he's always on me you know what i'm saying about this hell thing and whoever sent this, there was no name or return address on here, but whoever sent that, thank you uh, for caring about me. And um, but yeah, again, I don't believe in it. We've done a lot of different um, podcasts and just had that open discussion about what hell is. And um, again, I posted a, a, a comment the other day on a friend of mine's um, thread on Facebook, and it said, uh, if Christians will stop worrying about people going to hell, and start worrying about people who are in hell right now, then they might change the world. We might be able to change people from where they at, get them up out of that place of eternal darkness where they are now. And I'm not talking about people who have passed on and they're in hell now. I'm talking about people who, who are this whole podcast that we've been talking about for the last hour and a half, however long we've been on. People who are in hell, people who are strung out on dope, people who are addicted, people who are sinners in need of a savior. They need a way out. They've never heard of this gospel, never heard about the gospel of Christ to tell them, pull them up out of the darkness now, not when they die. But now, man, the gospel and what what Jesus represents and what he done is not something that he will do. It's something that he's already done for humanity, for all of us. And if you put your faith and trust in what he did, then you will be saved. Then you will come into everlasting life here. Heaven is not somewhere that you go when you die. Heaven is something that is within us that we can experience now. We can just like Justin, his story, experiencing the depths of utter darkness and demons pulling your mind and whispering to you and lying to you and the devil around every corner. You could be so full of the love of God to where that becomes your reality. 
you see the good in everything. You see the good in everyone. You can start speaking in faith to the things that are not as though they were because of the, the faith and love that you receive from Christ by simply putting your faith within it. There's a peace that surpasses all understanding. We found it in Christ. We tried to find it in other things. Peace, peace of mind, rest for your soul. Couldn't find it in any other thing. If you found it in other stuff, kudos. I found it in Christ and I'm going to let you know. So uh, that's my story. I'm sticking to it. I love you guys. Um, I believe in the power of prayer. Thank you for praying. Thank you for, for partnering with me and believing what I'm doing, bringing it to the table. Uh, thank you again for everybody who believes in my work and who is partnering with me on Patreon. Without that, this episode did not happen. Not in this shape, not in this capacity. Um, thank you. Because you guys are co-creators with me. It doesn't happen without you. Thank you for all the donations. Thank you for all the shares, the likes, the retweets, you know, all of it, man. It all helps in some shape, form or fashion, whatever you're able to do. Thank you, guys. You guys mean the world. Uh, Patreon.com backslash True Seeker. You get access to a lot of stuff. So you, it's, I think it's a fair exchange. You go over there and check out some of the stuff that we have available. Also, again, September the 14th, tickets are available for our Christ Consciousness Conference. You don't want to miss it. Go check out all the stuff that we have lined up. I'm, doing some, uh, I'm going to be doing some teaching on light healing, sound healing, vibrational frequencies, sacred geometry, how it relates to our body. We're going to listen to the music. We're going to let it wash over us, and we're going to enter into a time of prayer and fellowship through that. If you can make it, uh, people are traveling from, traveling from all over, so make sure you can uh, try to be a part of that. It's going to be awesome. So, with that, I'm going to say peace and shalom. Thank you, guys. Y'all mean the world to me. Love you all. Peace, peace. Your will so much That does it for this episode, folks. To hear more episodes of the Truth Seeker podcast, head over to truthseeker.com. And if you're wanting to support the show and get rewards, go to our Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash truthseeker.